Hey troops, uh, welcome to Tuesday's Live with Dr. Buzz. I am fasting uh, a little over 60 hours now and a glucose of 77, ketones of 2.4. I have had a week in the past week that had a very uncomfortable moment when talking about and learning about the COVID vaccination uh, updates. And although that's not what I'm talking about this week, I am gonna share that uh, I think you'll find it useful because it's a very intimate story about a time when, yeah, <laughs> my life was super uncomfortable. Uh, it happened in the spring of 2010. And heck, the year before, 2009, <laughs> I thought I had arrived. I thought that the world had um, a tail and I was holding on to it. I am a farm kid from a small town. I had 21 kids in my graduating class. And when I said I wanted to be a doctor, the world laughed and said, <laughs> yeah, right. And so years of education and turning into the uh, noise of telling folks I can do it and not just telling anybody, just doing it. I had the job. I had a four day a week job. I had just been recruited back to my home state of South Dakota. Uh, I'd been there not even a year and a half and they let me work four days a week. I had three kids. We had just moved into a house that I paid for <laughs> and I knew how I was gonna pay off my student loans. I had life by the tail and then I didn't. There were some parts of that story that um, the job I had was sucking the soul right out of me. And I had said yes to things that I'm not very proud of, but I said, well, everybody else says that is doing it. This seems to be what you do in corporate medicine. And I had agreed and agreed and agreed until a point where I said, I can't do that. And that decision had consequences. And I said, no, I'm not doing that. You can fire me. And they did, they did worse than fire me. They said, you're disruptive, <laughs> which then of course led to, nobody would even interview me when you have that label in a small town. And I was supposed to leave the state. That's what they wanted me to do. You have a non-compete. You gotta move out, of the, move out of the state. And I said, I just moved my family across the country. My, my parents are sick, my husband's parents are sick. I'm, we're not moving, there has to be another way. And they said, well, you can see the homeless and you can see Medicaid for two years. And this is the spring of 2010 and I was, I was devastated. I thought that I had figured out how to have the most comfortable, perfect life. I had worked hard to be great at what I was doing and now I found myself the sheep outside the flock, the one that was easy to attack. I had to figure out how to run a clinic, which doctors are good at things, but nobody teaches you how to run a clinic. And, and my husband did not know what to do with his wife, who's usually bubbly and full of energy and positive and glass half full. And I remember being in church and they passed around a clipboard that my husband signed. And the next week, somebody called me and said, what kind of doctor are you? I said, a good one. <laughs> and she said, well, that's great. We need you in Haiti. <laughs> and I said, lady, I don't even know where Haiti is. And she said, your husband said to call you and tell you you're going to Haiti. And <laughs> I was like, I will talk to my husband. And she hung up and said, you pray about it. I'll call you tomorrow. And I had every comment. I was ready for the fight. She was gonna call me the next day and if she said that, I was gonna say this. If she said this, I was gonna say that. I was ready to fight. I am not going to Haiti. And I don't know what the heck came over my vocal cords, but I could not say no to that lady. And I find myself getting off of a plane after the 2010 earthquake in Haiti. And the level of uncomfortableness of discomfort that had happened to me in my world where my perfect utopia had been 
just flooded with all these first world problems that seemed to be devastating to me. And I get off this plane and I grew up on a farm where I can remember seeing the first dead thing before kindergarten. I think I had to be like four years old. It was a cow and it got really big and puffy and I, I poked it with a stick to see what happens and a bunch of flies came out. Dead things have a smell. And I knew that smell when I got off the plane. That there was this dusted look to the world as if it was a velvet painting. It wasn't really real, but the smell was real. And I remember trying to describe to my husband that, who was with me in this place where I didn't know I was out of sorts. I, had, I, I didn't know where Haiti was until I got there. I, I didn't know how to treat people in Haiti, and I sure as hell didn't know how to navigate through a destruction of death. And everything that was happening around me in, in that moment where I got off the plane, it was like the personification of what had happened to my career over the last nine months, that it had crumbled and it was dead. In the first 24 hours, I just remember thinking, I, I don't have the skills to deal with this. I, I, I'm super, like, repelled, like, th this is very uncomfortable. And despite the soul-sucking problem of what my career had done, I'm, this was worse. And I remember going to bed that night and there was no electricity. So the darkness was a level of, I mean, there, I mean, there was no street lights, there's no electricity. And the place that we were sleeping was on a floor. And all the Haitians slept outside because they were afraid the building would collapse on them. So any kind of creak, like, it startled me. And there were creepy crawly things in my bed. And I don't like spiders, but I, in South Dakota, we don't have that big of spiders. Uh, that, this, was a tr this was much bigger than what a spider should be. And, and I just remember thinking, I can't deal with one more thing uh, that the the consequences of being excommunicated from the the profession that I had sought to be a part of and now I was out of at least that's what I thought and now I am in a place where the first 24 hours have such a, a churn of anxiety that I don't know what to do with and I get up the next day and I had taken notes like what happens in Haiti what kind of infections do they have I don't have the ability to look anything up, which <laughs> I'm the kind of doctor where I could look anything up. Uh, Google's been around for my whole, whole training. And the iPhones don't work, and the, uh, the, I have these little notes, and I clearly wrote down the wrong things because I don't know what to do with these people. They keep having these symptoms. And I remember in a moment of frustration, I was praying, like, God, would you just help me out here? I don't know what to do. And this kid, this probably nine-year-old kid pukes pinworms on me. Like, this can't get any worse. And I'm hot and I'm irritable and I don't know what to do and I'm out of sorts. And he pukes pinworms. <laughs> and I remember that one of the preachers had advised us say, take something that's, that's comforting to you because you're gonna want to escape. And I had downloaded the movie Gandhi. <laughs> And it was, so it was on my phone and I have this battery that's dying. And so I'm back after the clinic. I do not want to be around other people. I'm very irritable. My husband's like, was this such a good idea? <laughs> and I try to dive into Gandhi. And the phone dies. And I remember falling asleep saying, what the heck did I do this for? And then the third day happens. The third day where you're reaching about 72 hours that before you, since you've seen electronics, you've now, there's something that heightens, the anxiety heightens before it breaks. And I remember solving a problem, a problem that I don't know how I remember that, but by the grace of God, I remember that albendazole is what we needed and the Red Cross had it and I wanted somebody to go get me 2,500 pills of albendazole at like 25 cents a piece. And we solved problems. And I remember driving away from that clinic where this uncomfortableness had like consumed me. And now I felt the greatest amount of euphoria. This moment that 
is tiny. It's really not something that I should be that proud of, but it was a moment I can't, I can never erase from my mind. Because if you were going to put happiness in a bottle, it's the highest moment of happiness that I could, I can possibly feel. And it happened as I was in this zone of unhappiness, of grieving and and that process of the low part of life, well, I got out of it by doing something very difficult. So tonight, we're actually talking about a book, a book that uh, I have been reading recently that well, has helped me through the past week, but has also helped me to look at some moments of struggle that patients have had. I wanted to say thank you for those people who have checked in and that have tuned back in this week after all of the drama in our channel over the last week. I have had some other setbacks happen on the side, like there's a few bots out there pretending to be me. I am not soliciting you emails anywhere, people. (laughs) If you're not on my email list, which happens uh, when you you go to, uh, not that one, hold on. When you go to this web page, you sign up for Get Keto Secrets from Dr. Boz every week. That's the only email you're getting from me. So sign up for those if you want them. I do actually little videos in there that are not censored. <laughs> so, um, but um, we also had three products come down off of Amazon this past week, which was strategically right after the day where we got demonetized on YouTube. I don't know if it has anything to do with each other. but. I am excited actually uh, to share this journey that I've been on, that I've been reading this book called The Comfort Crisis. And I should know the guy's name off the top of my head, but I can't think of it right now. He writes, this author writes a a very compelling story about how how comfortable our lives are. And the first, uh, the first section has to do with um, that our modern life is comfortable, but it is not making us happy. And he, he looks at how the first, um, um, the first day of, um, or that, that most of our life, uh, that most of our s- sections in life are 90% comfort. And I, I tell that story of, of when my life was perfect. I had reached for all the comfort in the world and I found it and I was there and then I, I clearly wasn't. And when I've been, I've just come out of in our, in our, um, our, our practice, our um, channel, uh, this class where I take 21 days and walk people through getting them uncomfortable. It's definitely first world problems. I'm not taking them to Haiti, but they are looking at something that they typically often used for comfort and we say I want you to have less than 20 total carbohydrates a day and that first week when you're pushing them to say yes I know you've used these as as tools to feel better but we're gonna we're gonna stop using that tool there's other ways you can feel better there's other things you can do but take notice of what happens when you remove this level of comfort and then the next week we do it even further we say I want to make sure you're not getting pleasure from food because that's the opposite of what we're trying to teach here. And so we say starting at this hour, at the first bite of sardines, this is the only food that you can eat for three days, for 72 hours. And that same process that actually several neuroscientists have looked into to say, there's a predictable process that happens when you take away a comfort that has become too comfortable. And the way you do that is you do something that's difficult. You kind of have to, not kind of, you have to look in the face of something that's difficult. Take away those carbohydrates. Eat nothing but sardines for 21 days. And in the first 24 hours, their anxiety rises. They're like, no way, this, this is not possible. Why would anybody do this? I don't need to do this. And for the thousands of generations in our species, you haven't needed to do that. <laughs> Life did it for you. But in our modern world, people aren't getting happier that comfort that they have um, in our modern life, it's the enemy. It's what's causing the pathology of, of disease, of unhappiness. 
and I contend it isn't making us ha happy. That when I look at this book, uh, there's, there's a, a theme that I think really says that when you're doing a difficult thing, when you're trying to work at life uh, and improve it, um, and then people push you to do difficult things, like in, in the 21 day, we make them share something that matter, an intimate story that, that tells you why, why would you want to work on this? And that before they get to the end of the second week, it's, it's very apparent that the goal is not to cause you pain, but the goal of losing weight or getting the, you know, being in ketosis or anti-inflammatory, the goal was never the goal at all. The goal to go to Haiti wasn't to be uncomfortable, but the side effect, the side effect might have been the goal. And when you read this book, The Comfort Crisis, the guy is actually uh, an alcoholic. And he says, yeah, I had generations of examples of what alcoholics did. And he was privileged. He had this wonderful job and he could write for a living and he was you know, blessed <laughs> to be able to do it without a lot of struggle. And so he was you know, weekend to weekend living out this, this pattern that anybody outside the pattern can see it's headed for destruction. And now he's in his late 20s and early 30s where the, the use of alcohol to make his life more comfortable so that the relationships weren't as intimate, so that the job was just kind of mindless and he did it good enough. And he was actually blogging about how to be healthier, but behind the scenes living a terribly unhealthy life, telling himself that this drinking pattern is going to be different than last time. I'm not going to do that again. And if you've worked around addiction, you've heard them say it again and again, saying, no, it, the, the goal isn't to get you to not want alcohol. The goal is the side effect of what happens when you distract your life with something besides a substance or carbs. And as he gets into his sobriety, he, well, he starts to look at, I was really using booze to comfort myself. And well, what other things are hard to do? What's an uncomfortable? So a buddy asks him to go to the wilderness in Alaska. And well, he's not a hunter. He's not a wilderness guy. He's a pretty healthy guy, but um, he, well, he takes on the Alaskan wilderness in many ways, like I took on that trip to Haiti, kind of bumbling through it. And smack dab at 72 hours, his brain shifted quietness was quieter than anything he'd ever heard before. The darkness was deeper than anything he'd ever experienced. And he was bored. <laughs> the boredom uh, was something that we don't, we don't like to feel. That when I look at um, the, the, the story of this comfort crisis, he's trying to connect with uh, the uh, migration of a, of a caribou herd with this expert um, hunter. And although it looked like he was headed out to experience Alaska, what he really found was by doing something very difficult and unexpected and a new experience, um, his life was getting better. There was a new level of, uh, you can call it sobriety, but a new level of connectedness. Um, you know, the, the, the other major um, parts to this story um, yes, modern life is comfortable, but the second thing was he talked about physical challenges and these new experiences improve our mental health. And I've, I've walked around uh, folks with mental health problems for, the, you know, for 25 years, and I will tell you that as they begin to see, well, why, is, why am I struggling so much? You know, how do I improve and make my life more comfortable? Uh, this morning at the Pin Chasers, I, I asked people for examples of, is there some, you know, do you have an example of when your life was, you know, headed in the right direction, you've been doing everything as, as you're supposed to, that uh, in many ways I got excommunicated in, out of the corporate medicine because I wasn't being polite the way other physicians were saying, yeah, we can do that. Yeah, we can make that exception. We can do that again. And although I did it for several times, I got to that, I'm not doing that. I'm not, I can't do that one. And they called it disruptive, and I think God was just testing me, saying, how much are you going to put up with before you do something brave? 
that will make you lonely, that will make you look like you're not the success that you were dreaming you would be. Instead, you're going to have to figure this out as, as the sheep outside the flock. And I had this woman today in the support group say, I've been saying yes to a friend who just complains about her life over and over again. And every time she would complain in the last couple of months, I would, I would hear her complaining. It's like as she put that anxiety on my plate, I would receive it. And my coping skill was to eat. And I, can't, I couldn't get back into I couldn't find the improvements I was putting on weight. And finally, I said, I have to stop being your friend. I have to stop listening to you. I cannot hear you complain about your life anymore. And she said, my friend was like so distraught. That's the extreme that the woman was willing to go to to say, but if I don't give this anxiety to you, who will I give it to? And she goes, it was very comfortable to continue to receive that well, that tax of being her friend until the moment where I said, I have to do something much more difficult, which is to not, to not allow her to do that, to put up a boundary that said, I'm not doing that. And I, I realized that if I, I wasn't coming to the support group or something, I probably would have kept doing that because I haven't made a ketone in two months and I really want my health back. And so I, I, the parallels between what he writes about in this comfort crisis, um, you know, and, and how powerful that trans transition is from, well, like the first 24 hours I landed in Haiti, I'm actually removing electronics. I, I, there's no electronics. Um, <laughs> I had to write down what I wanted done. There was no typing. Um, in fact, it wasn't a clinic, it's a tent, and we're just triaging, and yet all of my training, I, it was there, was, there was way more that had happened on my family farm that prepared me for that moment than the training I'd received. Uh, <laughs> they talk, there's, a, there's another part of the book where he says, yeah, um, there's a, a camp for 25 to, you know, 20 to 30 year olds, or they're looking to detox, they're looking to like find peace and harmony and it's in Utah where, um, where they don't exactly tell the people that they're going to be out of cell phone coverage when they get to this you know, remote place. And they arrive at this place in Utah where they're at least 10 to 15 miles from anywhere. There is no cell phone coverage, there's no electricity, there's, there's no uh, modern amenities. And to watch the people cope with that loss in those first 24 hours and how their anxiety goes higher and higher. And as they do that, <laughs> the second day where they get ticked off at their phone and uh, some of them actually say, I'm just going to walk to the nearest place to, to post on Instagram. <laughs> and you're like, that's really stupid. Uh, but it's not till the third day where that, the comfort that they've used to deal with life was they don't, they're not bored ever because they have an iPhone, uh, they have electronics, they have social media, and now that's been removed. So if you take away that comfort, now what do you do? And that puzzle in your head that you kind of have really been struggling about, but you push it away and you don't deal with it, and now, and now you have this emptiness, this space where you can, you can join this less noisy spot in your brain, it kind of relaxes. Well, that's not an accident. It's, it's actually 72 hours of detox that it takes for the brain to really come down from that. And I saw that in the 21 day course where you're taking away carbs, <laughs> where they're taking away um, pleasure from food. And, and when, you know, when I was in Haiti, when he was in the wilderness, you see this pattern that, oh, that's not an accident. This escape plan where they're you know, going to detox, life doesn't really begin, the improvements don't really begin until you get past that 72 hour withdrawal process. I'm like, huh, that's about what it takes to get off of, a, a, you know, several of the, the addictive drugs that we talk about in medicine. And as they enter into that space, I, I look at the reviews of what did it feel like at the end of the 72 hours. And you, you expect complaints because that's what you've that's what we've heard for the previous couple of days, but it's euphoric. It's that same moment in Haiti where I felt inappropriate bliss. Like, how do I have this much joy? I haven't felt this much joy. 
I mean, in that season of my life, it, was, it had been months. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I want to bottle that. And as I, as I look at some of the other um, um, uh, kind of highlights from this book, The Comfort Crisis, um, one, of the, one of the themes is how recharge, uh, we can recharge by experiencing solitude and boredom, especially when it's spent in the absence of uh, our populated world. And I grew up on a farm. I, I would say, yeah, 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 sure, people should get into nature. <laughs> and I mean, I can't tell you how much energy I spent trying to get off the farm. <laughs> a lot of energy. And now how much I, I seek to find that place where there's no person around me for at least 10 miles. It's alone. And although there's cell phone coverage, I don't have to choose to take that with me. And how much it does take about three days. When I would, my mom and dad lived on the farm and I would go visit, it was in that third day where I finally said, oh, I feel at home. That when I look at some of the setbacks from the past week, that, um, I mean, it's definitely a first world problem where the authorities say, naughty, naughty, we're going to remove the stream of income. And then I say, yeah, but um, in the same week, I, I got one of the highest joys. I, I wonder if it's because of that, that, I mean, first of all, disappointment in myself. That's what I shared last week on the story was how I mean, what was my part? What did I do? How could I have done that better? How could I have understood and had a better discernment during an episode where I don't know that I could have um, done it better, but that's my nature is to say, what, what should have I done differently? And I think the highest moment that I've had, that moment in Haiti is pretty amazing, but there's a second moment that happened this week that I'm going to tell you about in just a minute. Let me do a couple of housekeeping things here. Um, hold sorry. There we go. Uh, so this, um, I wanted to go to uh, a couple of announcements. First of all, um, I do have uh, uh, a, a couple of things that are happening this week. If you follow me on Instagram, on Thursday, I'm doing a giveaway. A giveaway for the tickets, um, two tickets to hack your health. So be sure to watch on Thursday on Instagram if you if you follow me there. Um, uh, hack your health is down here. Let me see where did I? Oops, did I already go past it? Nope. Hold on, I'll find it. There it is. Hack your health. Um, and if you use the DRBOZ code, you get fifty dollars off. That price increase is going up this next week. I thought on here there was the Peak Tees. Oh yeah, here we go. Peak Tees actually has a new product coming out, so I was gonna make sure that I, I'm not a big tea fan, but if I'm gonna drink tea, this is the only tea I drink because I do not like it being moldy. Uh, and this one is made in a way that it doesn't get moldy. <laughs> um, and the last thing that um, I, 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 I already said actually was to, to be sure to sign up for our newsletters. If you're, if you're getting solicited by somebody who says they're me, they're not me, uh, the only way I'll communicate with you is through these emails. Um, we are trying to change that. Uh, we have a couple of other ideas to make sure we can stay in communication with you. Um, uh, this week we, and this next month, we are, we are looking for anybody who's bought products off of our Amazon products to make sure you've left a review. Uh, when you get canceled on Amazon, the way you get back up is they look at how many positive reviews you've had. So if you've ever bought something on Amazon from us, go back and leave a review. It really, it really changes our ability to negotiate and get back active on, on those. All right, so I want to show you my top moment uh, of the week. Uh, and uh, it has to do, oh, I thought I had it here. Uh, hold on one second. have a prop um, that as I was reading the comfort crisis this past week it it 
helps you look into the face of, of uncomfortable things like a cold plunge, like a sauna, like a workout, like um, saying no when everybody else is saying yes. And how much that strengthens us, that when your life is feeling heavy and that chronic stress seems to be piling up, the answer is not to comfort yourself, it's to do hard things. And, you know, as a mom and, a, you know, somebody who tells people what I think they should do for their health, um, it gets hard to tell them that over and over and over again. But when I look at um, some of the, some of the peak moments, well, one happened this week when, um, when my son accomplished something that I, well, I, I didn't know if he would ever accomplish that. So I'm gonna tell you a story. Um, uh, I'm gonna use this slide to tell it to you too. So um, here, yeah, there we go. So you'll see over here on the left where he has, um, where he, that smiley face is. Uh, that's my son, he's a senior in high school and he comes home uh, the first week of school. He has been in wrestling since the third grade and we are from the the dynasty of wrestlers in the upper midwest where the northwest iowa southeastern south dakota everybody wrestles and he's the youngest son the other two didn't wrestle well there's a rule in wrestling that if you're going to be on the varsity team um, you get to you get to wrestle at one at, at the same weight throughout the season but um on a team you will um you you get to you know, if you're going to be on the varsity team, only one person at that weight can be wrestling that weight. So he wrestled 138 last year, and now he is hopping into a, the same team, but it has come of age of several wrestlers who've made it to state in the state of Florida. And although we come from a dynasty of wrestling around us, in our family, Chancellor had never made it to state. And he seemed to always be second. Uh, could never get to that, you know, the peak uh, at the end of the year. And he said to his coach this year, um, I know that the guy at 138, well, he's won state three times. The guy at 144, he's won state twice. The guy who's wrestling at 150, he's won state three times. The guy wrestling at 165, he's won state four times. So coach, what do you want me to wrestle? Do you want me to cut my weight down to 132 and the coach said chancellor i want you to wrestle at 175 pounds yeah that's a draw job jaw drop for your mother because this is what he looked like this is still what he looks like at the um, beginning of the year is that was at 152 pounds and this is preseason, but i said it's a good thing your mother <laughs> is great at metabolism because what his ad close advisors were saying was um, eat a bunch of carbs, put on a bunch of fat. And I'm like, you won't win. If you have to put on the muscle mass in order to compete at 175 pounds, you need to be make sure that every muscle is filled with extra mitochondria that you have, that you're lean and you're, that, you're, that you build muscle, not just fat. And so this picture over here, uh, over here, is him this past weekend, where he weighed in at 163 pounds, and he was at the districts for wrestling, um, the one of four regions in the state of Florida, for uh, for his competition. I want you to check this out. So there's two videos. Uh, this video um, is. Let's see. Um, hold on. Don't don't run away. <laughs> I gotta find the right button. No, not that one. Here we go. No, not there. Hold on. <laughs> Looms. No, don't go there. Oops. Oh yeah, here we go. Thank you. That's why I, I don't know why I had so, such a tough time. So this is the this is the meet right before. Um, the, the one that I want to show you, but I just want to give you a, a hint that when you are wrestling, um, the process to wrestle is, um, 
Well, you get three rounds, three rounds of two minutes. And you can see Chancellor right there. Um, this is on Saturday. And I don't know if you can see the difference in the size. This guy weighed 175 pounds and he cut weight uh, to get to the 175 pounds. That's what normally happens in a wrestling match. And he does end up winning this um, match at the end. I think you can see the score um, right here at the end. And then I'm gonna show you one of the proudest moments as a mom. Red, red, red. <laughs> you can hear me screaming and hollering where he is. I don't know if you can see that score, but it was 10 to two at the end of those six minutes. And now comes a moment where I know this kid has been pushing and wrestling at a degree that, um, well, most would have given up. Most would have never agreed that the to the coach that you don't weigh 175 pounds, but you have been wrestling at 175 pounds. And I just, uh, here's a... <laughs> That's Chancellor. And his opponent, you're going to hear right here. Okay, 40 and 0. He's been to state. He's not lost in 40 matches. And here is this kid who's been doing tough things. How does he get his muscle mass up over the last year? He looked at that alarm clock at 5 o'clock and didn't sleep in. He went to CrossFit before school and then went to the wrestling room afterwards. He ate way more sardines than he will ever admit. Uh, and if you've ever tried to get a teenage boy to listen to his mother, he listened a little bit. <laughs> but he has really been looking in the face of difficult things for for the better part of this past, I mean, for many years, but never had he got to this point. So I want you to look at that scoreboard in the back there. It's zero to zero. This match right here means it's the first round. Um, the one with the red on his ankle is the opponent. The one with the green on the ankle is Chancellor. And you got three of these, which are, I mean, they are two very athletic, muscular boys giving it their all. And um, it, it's not a little fight. As the match goes on, <laughs> I mean, talk about doing difficult things. And I'm, I'm a wrestling mom, I, I didn't mean to be, but I am telling you one way to make really good men is to have them do this difficult thing again and again and again. And he's about to run out here. And I want you to now notice what happens in the background now. So we skip forward to here and you can see uh, we've got 49 seconds. It's one to one. This is the third round, that three in the middle. So we have 49 seconds and either we're gonna go into overtime or one of the boys is gonna win. And again, undefeated, 40 matches undefeated. And the other guy weighs 175, Chancellor weighs 163. And here it is. <laughs> it's coming, just hang in there. 10 more seconds. He's got to score. He's got to get his butt around there to score. There he goes. He just scored. <laughs> and I know that kid is not going to score in the next 20 minutes. And that crazy woman screaming in the background. That is a blissful happiness. That is what joy feels like when you've been looking and doing hard things juxtaposed to a moment of celebration. Well, the, uh, the prop was the gold medal for districts. So I would love everybody to pray that there are no injuries as he goes to state in Florida uh, on Wednesday. <laughs> Thursday is when they wrestle. All right, so I'm really excited to share that. Uh, even if you're not a wrestling fan, I hope you're a mom fan and you can hear the insane amount of pleasure I got watching him reach for something that um, there's no guarantee that, you know, especially with such an underdog setup where I don't know if you've ever tried to wrestle somebody who's six inches bigger, that, taller than you and 13 pounds of muscle mass heavier than you, but there is a part of your soul that has to have grit beyond measure. Let's go to your questions today. Uh, I will, um, I will uh, gladly answer them as we focus on some of the, um, oh, let's see. Um, hold on here. Let me, 
Let me go back to here and get this set up a little better. Mm, here we go. Oops, I was on the wrong page. All right, so we have a question today starting with, um, oops, a little big there. Let me get that a little smaller. Um, saying, can keto cause scalp itch? There's no rash. Uh, six weeks of keto, fasted f twice for 48 hours. Uh, I'm one meal a day, no other problems. So, uh, so let me talk about that. Scalp itch can be a, a dermatitis that um, is exacerbated when the food supply. So, so what is dermatitis uh, of, of the scalp? you can call it in extreme cases, you can call it psoriasis where there's an autoimmune component, but it does mean that the top layers of the skin, that epidermis, that's it's really dead skin in between the layers of the epidermis. Well, some critters live, <laughs> some fungus and some yeast can live in there. And although that's what, you know, good tar uh, shampoos can do to help decrease the inflammation, decrease the home for these critters. Uh, and there are several treatments that we use when that scalp dermatitis gets to be severe. Um, but when you particularly find it flaring after they've been on a ketogenic diet, uh, it has a lot to do with a, a fungal yeast infection. Um, that, though, the, when, you, when you biopsy the, the scalp infections that flare after somebody goes keto, uh, you'll see that there is a higher growth of this um, fungus or yeast that is in between those skin layers. You say, well, did, the, did they, the keto diet do that? It's not so much that the keto diet did that. It's the lack of sugar that you've been feeding those dead layers of skin. I mean, there's no blood that goes to that. The blood goes to the dermal layer. That's the skin layer below that. But sugar gets delivered into these spaces. And those critters like to live off of it. When you deny it, they tend to replicate, which causes an intense, like, itching. Um, the keto rash is actually a very similar process that's happening at different areas on the body, but I'll tell you the most common place it happens is on the scalp. So what's the antidote? What's the answer? Is to lower the blood sugar even further. People say, but doc, I eat carbs and I feel better. I'm like, uh-huh. You just fed those little fellas the sugar that they were demanding. So just like in the stories of uh, comfort crisis, do not let those critters be comfortable. <laughs> Turn into the spin lower the blood sugar even further, uh, I would contend that if you succeeded at those two 48-hour fasts, that I would push you to go 72-hour fasts. And you will find the intensity of the itching gets really the most difficult in those last 72 hours, but that is when the biggest drop in number of those, uh, those uh, fungal uh, infections really improve. Um, you might have to do it more than once to get it to go away. We had a couple folks in our... Um, in our uh, support group here who'd been keto for a long time and then finally ended up with um, a keto rash and she just couldn't do 72 hour fast. And I said, I think the only way you're gonna get this rash to go away is to push through and get a really lower blood sugar because her blood sugar was hanging up just high enough to, to let that rash smolder. And by golly, by the third 72 hour fast, it has not come back. Um, and th that's just one story. There's many of those stories. All right. Next question says, uh, male, 33 years old. I have epilepsy and would like to lose weight on keto. The problem is that I, uh, the problem I have is that I can't reduce the number of meals because it goes too long without food for my seizures. All right. So I would contend that if you have epilepsy and you have seizures, um, when I'm teaching my seizure patients, what, what is the best pattern for keeping that, um, um, that chemistry set to keep them seizure free? It, it has to do with that stable level of, a, of ketones. Um, I haven't done a very good job of drinking my, my pucker up water here, but this is a good example of what I have my seizure patients do is they'll put non sugar sweetened, just the plain ketones in a, in a, um, in a capsule to pucker up in water and they, they replace ketones all day long. When I hear that a seizure patient needs to eat uh, frequently to keep them seizure free, uh, you've, got, you've got an inflammatory process that's often happening in the brain. And that comes with the support of up and down blood sugars. So to stabilize the blood sugars, the ketones have to be better replaced. 
So pucker up is one way, but the actually what most of my pucker up is kind of an expensive way to do that. It's liquid BHB. There's no sweetener in it. There's nothing but BHB in it. It's, you know, it, it is pretty powerful. But what I have most people do is something much more economical, which is uh, the MCT C8C10 capsules. But they have to take like seven to 10 of them three times a day. Um, the replacement of, again, medium chain triglycerides. Let me just take a drink for you. Um, the medium chain triglycerides are an oil that does not need to be digested. It can just be absorbed. And once that absorption happens, it, it skips the lymph system. It doesn't need to be sorted out for, you know, storing fat. Uh, it goes into the liver and then it's in circulation. Those, those strings of fat can cross the blood-brain barrier and those strings of fat can be used by the astrocytes in your brain, the mitochondria in your brain, to be a fuel source. It's a ketogenic fuel source. It's a fat, fatty acid fuel source. The best part about that is the length of time that you will increase the ketone production. Again, that lower inflammatory state for a seizure patient is really important. When I see people eating several meals a day, they're pushing the insulin button, they're pushing the storage button um, instead of pushing the ketogenic uh, production more solidly. So, you know, I, Mac, I really actually have a lot of sympathy for what it's like to have um, a seizure disorder because many of the medications that are used to help with that, they are just rotten on metabolism and they do cause appetite stimulus. To get the weight off, um, you really do need to increase the amount of ketones in circulation. I have my patients push the supplementation side of it, not so much, um, I mean, that's where I go first because you, you do not want another seizure. Seizure, you want, that, you want that ketogenic state really solid. But to think that the seizure patients don't have insulin resistance is uh, it's just that, that's not true. They have insulin resistance. You need to decrease the number of meals per day because you're an adult. You're 33 years old. And to keep that weight off, the number of meals per day turn into so much insulin production that it becomes a difficult balance between uh, seizure control, weight control, seizure control. So I've, I know where you're stuck. Uh, step one is replace the ketones in, in your body. And then you do need to decrease the number of meals. You do need to land that eating window and squeeze it more towards morning. Um, yeah, good question. All right, Rose writes in and says, Dr. Boz, what kind of keto diet did you recommend for cancer patients? Well, I would tell you that I am not about to get <laughs> sanctioned by YouTube again this year, this week for any kind of medical advice. I did write a book called Any Way You Can. Uh, the audio book is what I often recommend for um, my cancer patients because it talks about when my mom had cancer and what I did in her case. Uh, the audio book is just a great story. It's like 70% story and then you see what I did. The, there's another book out there that came <laughs> called Keto Continuum, and that is the step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step process that uh, I use for patients. I mean, those, those handouts that I would give in the clinic are now in a workbook that go along with the story saying, here's the step-by-step. -step. But uh, Rose, it's a tough story to have cancer, uh, and um, the story about my mom can be very inspiring to say, what, what did I do when it was my mother? Um, all right, next question is great. Uh, Tori J writes in and says, I'm not comfortable. <laughs> you knew that was gonna get on the, the list of questions because it totally fit with our theme today. I'm not comfortable. I was just diagnosed with Hashimoto's and leaky gut, what should I do? Every YouTube and Google find says something different. Who do I, what do I believe? What can help me? You know, the, the key here uh, of something that not only is, um, uh, I mean, Hashimoto's is a autoimmune problem where your immune system is accidentally attacking your thyroid and your, your immune system should never attack your thyroid. Uh, leaky gut can be the beginning of another autoimmune problem where that slime layer uh, that should be protecting your gut, the immune system is also attacking that. Um, when, when you look at what, what is the antidote for an immune system that's gone awry, that's doing the wrong things, decrease the inflammation, decrease the signal of what happens in a swampy or very fluid heavy, uh, a very inflamed uh, immune system, whether that's in your bone marrow or your lymph nodes. 
And what does that look like? That means a consistent and persistent ketogenic state. Um, if you type in Dr. Boz or yeah, Dr. Boz and leaky gut, there's a couple of really great slide decks that I've used to teach. What am I trying to get you to see? And how do you decrease that inflammation long enough for you to build back up that mucosal layer? That's really what a leaky gut is, is that it's permeable to things that it shouldn't be permeable to. Um, that if it was me, I would be eliminating everything but sardines for a good three weeks and you can't believe the number of things that get fixed when you do that. That's, that's uncomfortable to have sardines for three weeks for sure. Um, all right, I, I hope those uh, videos help you. Lorraine writes in and says, do illnesses like a cold, the flu, or COVID affect the blood glucose? Will, will it keep it raised even if uh, you keep carbs down? Well, that's a great question. When people are ill, um, there are several processes going on. Um, like just take for instance that you, you, you run a fever. Uh, if you've got uh, influenza, or you've got um, even just uh, uh, an upper respiratory infection, that immune system is pushing uh, itself to, to fight off that infection. That alone takes a higher level of metabolic churn and um, that the glucose will, will be higher. The cortisol in your body is increased. It's got a revved up system trying to fight off the infection. And unfortunately, when you're doing that on a bed of insulin resistant people, people who've had far too much glucose, far too much insulin, far too many meals per day, and now you add an infection onto that, that churn of raising the cortisol pushes the glucose higher as well. So it's, you know, when, when people say, gee, my doctor put me on prednisone to decrease the inflammation and my blood sugars went way up. I'm like, that's what happens when our own body produces prednisone, which is cortisol, to the system is it raises the blood sugar. And it's a, a sign of a higher churn. You know, if you look at ancestrally, you've got an infection going on, you need the access to easy, readily available glucose to feed your immune system. But in those, in your ancestors, the average blood sugar was, 100, it was 70, not 110. And so by, um, so that, that increased cortisol that uh, during the infection, which raises the blood sugar, well, it was a perfect build to help the immune system deal with that infection. In a patient whose blood sugars are already in the triple digits, 100, 105, and then you add cortisol, which is what your body produces during that infection, the blood sugars go even higher. Uh, so a good question, Lorraine. Uh, last one, um, and um, let's go here. Uh, I'm in, I'm at my goal weight. I'm keeping carbs under 20. My blood glucose in the morning is close to 100. Mm. Adding protein, trying to build muscle, but could it be too much? I'm a 58 year old female. You know, that, that uh, 100 glucose in the morning is the part that's got me nervous. Okay, so f congratulations on the goal weight, first, first of all. Um, morning blood glucose is of 100. That is a signal that your average blood sugar is going to be too high. That if we were, you know, what happens when the average blood sugar stays too high? That's when you glycate things like tendons and red blood cells and heart cells and gut linings. Glycate means that the sugar, the extra sugar sticks on things that it should not stick on. That glycation process is an aging process. So 58 years old, we want you to, you know, although you're at your goal weight, I'm telling you the metabolism needs a couple of workouts. Uh, you need to be burning more blood sugar, burning more sugar during the day than you're putting in. So there are three ways to, that you can really push that metabolism. You can fast and I contend that you probably won't get that blood sugar down to the 70 until, you know, 60. I mean, what was my blood sugar at the beginning of the 74? Uh, until you're at 64, 60 to 72 hours. Uh, I say that because I'm guessing that you didn't just wake up yesterday with insulin resistance. You've had a decade or so of excess insulin. And that high blood sugar is not gonna budge the first time around. I gave a really great lecture of this on the 21 day that we're hoping to make a video of, we haven't yet. But it talks about how even though your insulin um, comes down, 
that when that blood sugar stays high in the morning, it is a predictor that you are aging faster than you should. So, you know, Bernie, the first thing I would point out is the more important metric, when you say, I'm at my goal weight, I would say, do not look at the scale. Congratulations for being at a goal weight, but now stop looking at the scale. And the number one metric that matters in your case is getting that morning fasting blood sugar down into that 65 to 75, a healthy number, not just an okay number. And if you can do that and be hitting that 65, 75 blood glucose in the morning for you know, seven checks out of 10, that is a healthy goal. By adding protein, uh, okay, add protein if you need to, you're at a pretty good weight. What I would be making sure is that the eating window you have is a solid eating window. I don't know if you've read um, that keto continuum where I say, no, you need to land and squeeze. You need to land the number of hours you can get two boluses of food into you and then slide it towards that morning sunrise so that your last bite of food might need to be at three o'clock in the afternoon. Might need to be at four o'clock or two o'clock, but you'll be able to play with um, that last bite of food is one of the best predictors in cases like yours for what is the morning glucose going to be. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. All right, folks, I uh, want to say one more time, I appreciate you guys tuning in. It's been a heck of a week. I am going to say one more plug that anybody who's ever bought something from us on Amazon, we did conveniently have three of our products be taken down for something that does not make any sense. Uh, so we are looking for anybody to leave us a nice review. If you've bought something on Amazon, that's the only way you can leave a review. If you haven't bought something on Amazon, eh, it's a tough moment. Um, I will, oh, I was going to check my blood sugars again and ketones. I didn't have much of a, um, much to drink here. So let me quickly do that um, and call it a night. I did want to say a special shout out uh, to our, uh, our behind the scenes workers of coaches and um, uh, those that have show up every week helping me, uh, even when we get demonetized. Um, and then if you're looking for a good book on a story about doing difficult things, uh, getting out of your comfort, I recommend The Comfort Crisis. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. I don't agree with everything in the book, but I do, I do think it talks about a lot of improvements that really have been. So uh, blood sugar 77, ketones counting down here. Um, and I didn't have, I had like three sips of my little thing. Yeah, 2.8. So not much different than that at the beginning, but I guess a little bit. So uh, yeah, that's what Pucker Up does. We'll see you next week, folks. We continue to improve your health one ketone at a time. Thanks for not